Hello and welcome to yet another video and in this video I have another old camera to actually share with you guys and it's this camera right here it's the Nikon D100 now yes this camera came out way back in around 2002 which makes this camera about just over 20 years old and despite being such an old camera I think it's still a very interesting camera to actually take a look at and also just experiment with because the sensor inside the look of it and everything is just very different and even the class of this camera from Nikon the D100 is also very different in terms of styling compared to the more iconic D200, 300, D300S, everything, you know, which is a bit more ruggedly built design and just, you know, has a more overall design language that what you usually see from Nikon cameras today even. So yeah, without further ado, let's get into the video. So the Nikon D100, now this camera came out actually way back in 2002 and as mentioned earlier, this is actually kind of an interesting time period for photographers because it's during the time when a lot of photographers were actually switching or converting from analog cameras to digital cameras and by just holding this camera in your hands and also just operating it, it really feels... It, or it really just brings you to that time period simply because the grip, the design, the actual design language of this camera is very different from more modern Nikon DSLRs and also even DSLRs from Nikon way back even 10 years ago because there are a lot of things that Nikon decided to actually omit and or just redesign from this camera and if you take a look at the D200 you know, you start seeing a lot of the familiar design language on this camera more than the D100, whether it's this stripe right here, the red stripe underneath, whereas on the D100 it's kind of like tucked in inside the grip and also just a much bigger top display with a much more rugged looking as well as feeling cameras that came after the D200. So yeah, the D100, it was just kind of a mixed bag and everything, but we won't really be bashing about the D100. I'll just be talking about three different categories as usual. So the first one is the ergonomics, the operational side of things, the usability, and then onto the image quality and then into the conclusion why I might recommend it and why I don't to some people, actually to a lot of you guys, I don't really recommend this camera. But yeah, let's first actually start with the ergonomics, the usability side of things of this camera. So this camera, as mentioned earlier, when you actually grip this camera, it doesn't feel like a traditional Nikon camera. It actually just feels like some of the older Nikon film cameras that they were just kind of like a grading to but also in the meantime just yeah just wanted something different that it doesn't feel completely like their film camera especially when this camera is not only the experimental camera but it's also like a camera that's supposed to bring a lot of analog shooters that trusted old Nikon system over to the Nikon digital system so yeah you really feel a lot of difference and everything that being said this camera is still very comfortable to use being a camera that you know it's very bare bones down to it's just photography core and especially back then when photographers didn't need a lot of features that more modern cameras would actually offer. You actually have a lot of the core basic control buttons at your fingertips and pretty much you don't really have to access the menu but if you do the menu is actually very simple very neatly laid out as well and also very organized. So you can really efficiently access your menu and just kind of still see that everything is still logically arranged and also naming that you know it's not really weirdly named like many of the sony cameras but yeah it's just a very easy to navigate camera it's also a very efficiently designed and also very efficiently navigate or operated camera as well and that's actually quite nice i also really love the two dials here one in the front and one in the back yes nikon even has it way before this camera but it's still something about nikon that i really love using these two dials it's a very quick it's very very responsive and it's also very tough because many of the you know newer cameras from Nikon after that the dials actually isn't really as well built and um, it isn't like it doesn't really last that long and sometimes the actual ball bearing inside turns really loose and you have to press it really hard to actually turn and that was actually the problem with the D200 back dial here I really have to press it really hard for it to actually turn so yeah I really love the build quality of the internal bits of this it really shows that it's really ruggedly designed but where it's not really as rugged as the more modern DSLRs from Nikon or even from other you know companies is the actual weather ceiling 
Nikon does have basic water sealing in here, but it's just really basic. It's nothing like the D200 and onwards where it's much, much more durable. You'll be more confident actually bringing those cameras to like downpour situations or through the desert through sand and everything but with this you still can bring it through like um, certain harsh weather but just not overly as harsh as what you would actually bring like the d200 d300 d300s and what have you to and to the next point this camera actually has a 95 percent viewfinder coverage so it's not that bad but in the same time you kind of wish that this camera category would actually have a 100 percent view coverage that being said, many of the uh, competition out there during this time period also still had like 95 to 97% viewfinder coverage, so they're actually not behind either, but it's just something to actually keep in mind. And the viewfinder in here is actually not really that bright, but it will actually get the job done. If you're coming out from a lot of the uh, film cameras, you will be actually quite at home with this camera because the viewfinder is actually roughly the same brightness as the average film DSLR, well, film SLR from that time. And and talking about the viewfinder, this actually has a really nice diopter. I really love this diopter because it's just like, you know, an up and down kind of uh, switch rather than one of those wheel switch, which I find that you can actually knock quite easily. And when you do knock on them, you can actually find it a little bit time consuming to switch them, rotate them back to the original, uh, your eyesight level. Whereas this one, it's actually very quick and simple. So yeah, there's that. And there's actually five autofocusing points within the viewfinder finder so it's not a lot but you can actually get the job done so if you're actually doing like basic street photography basic landscape photography basic product or just um, street or portraits or what have you just if you know what you're doing and if you know the limitation, especially on the speed side of things, which isn't really that fast you can get the job done but if you're really demanding on the actual sports scenarios or like speed scenarios you really don't want to be using this camera i think you can actually train yourself to manual control or manual focus the actual focus ring much faster than the actual focusing system in here because this is an old camera and just like the problem with many of the older cameras there is a noticeable shutter lag i'm not talking about the shutter lag that you get with older dslrs that you know after using it intensively sometimes you get like a one second shutter lag or something but it's just a natural Natural old camera shutter lag in terms of like it's just not as responsive as the more modern DSLR that kind of shutter lag so just keep that in mind on top of the already kind of like sophisticated yet not really quick autofocusing system in here and what I meant by sophisticated well I mean it in the way that at the time it was actually quite accurate quite sophisticated for what it is but for nowadays if you want to use it in like low light condition you have to wait a while and sometimes it actually doesn't work but if you just use it in the normal you know daylight or normal lighting condition like this for example that i'm actually talking from the camera things like that then the camera will be just fine and when it actually confirms that it is in focus then it is in focus so yeah it just works but don't expect it more than that so yeah and now to the next point which is the media storage this camera actually takes my favorite media storage which is the CF cards. I really love CF cards, though nowadays I'm slowly preferring the CF Express much more. But CF cards are nice. I tend not to put like higher storage into uh, the older DSLRs simply because you don't really know how high capacity, well, high, you can actually put in simply because these came out, you know, way back in the days when you have like 512 megabyte CF cards or even 215 megabyte CF cards. So try not to put a lot of of high capacity cars into these cameras because it might actually not recognize them and if you can just find like a simple under four gigabyte you're actually kind of in the safe zone so it's just also like you know if you're coming from Canon it's like the 10d era or it's the 300d era or even this very first Canon DSLR video about it coming soon the Canon D30 it was way back when Canon had their D in front of their numeric model number so it's also quite nostalgic of course it's also really whoa 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 <laughs> almost dropped it there but yeah it's also very old but anyway 
Back to the D100, this camera can actually shoot at around 3 frames per second. Back then it was actually quite something because, you know, average film cameras can shoot at around 3 frames per second anyway, even semi-professional one. Of course there were professional ones that were able to actually shoot at over 9 frames per second, but in general, in this price range back then 3 frames per second were actually considered as normal. And the buffer is about 6 frames, so essentially you just have about 2 seconds to actually uh, shoot your burst which was actually enough for most cases but you know if you're spoiled by the more modern uh, camera offerings and even like entry-level DSLRs can actually do over five frames per second nowadays or even from seven or eight years ago so just to keep that in mind but of course you know if you're not really into a lot of fast-moving captures or just you know shooting wildlife things like that then three frames per second is really enough for general purposes so just to keep that in mind. And adding onto that, this camera is only able to really capture up to 4,000th of a second shutter speed, whereas, you know, more modern DSLRs are able to capture up to 8,000th of a second shutter speed, despite some of the entry level being able to only capture up to 4,000th of a second as well. Of course, you can just say like, but David, many of the film cameras can actually only do between 1,000th of a second to even 2,000th of a second, very rarely 4,000th of a second. Of course, but you have to really think about if you're shooting a lot of portraits, as especially outdoors or some sort of products that requires you to actually shoot really bright aperture and also with bright source of light. The 4,000th of a second might not really be all that fast for you because if you're actually starting to use, you know, f1.4 or f1.2, this camera might not keep it unless if you use some sort of lower light source or if you just use ND filter in front. But of course, that's really just limiting you in terms of which condition you can actually shoot in. So yeah, just keep that in mind. And of course, there were actually film cameras that can actually shoot up to 8,000th of a second and also much higher than that. But majority of the film cameras were able to actually just capture between 1,000th of a second and 4,000th of a second. So yeah. And now moving on to the ports, well this camera has a very limited amount of ports, there's one here, there's one underneath as well, and my camera isn't really in a good condition either, as you can see that uh, my USB uh, port is actually missing its flap, so yeah, just to keep that in mind with some of the older Nikon DSLRs, you will potentially be missing some of the port covers as well and talking about the usb port this is actually the usb 1.1 port so if you're a type of person who like to actually transfer file with the usb cable from the camera to the computer like i am this actually takes you way back a long time but because this camera has you know a very low megapixel count therefore a very low file size it actually doesn't really consume that much amount of time to actually transfer files that being said with this camera since i don't have the driver for it since you know it doesn't support the more modern operating system anymore. Um, using the old CF card to the card reader isn't really a bad thing either. And yeah, now onto my last point, which is actually the screen itself. The screen itself is actually really small. It actually gets its job done. It's not the brightest, it's not the most detailed, nor it's actually the most color accurate, but you can really get the job done because you still can actually see your framing, your basic color, although I really wouldn't trust the color accuracy and the contrast accuracy so much, but it's just there to, you know, function that you can actually see the images that, oh wow, okay, I got the framing right, or no, I really want to get rid of this part of the area of this image and things like that. It's enough just for that. But for anything else, it's just don't don't really rely too much on it. But the advantage is, of course, you have more palm rest area as well as you have more rest area for your finger over here as well. If you want to access your menu, it's also very comfortable, things like that. But other than that, it's just what it is. It's good enough for navigating through the menu. It's actually pretty bright enough as well just to navigate through your menu. And you won't be spending a lot of time in your menu anyway, since all of these buttons are actually your core essential buttons to just access your main settings anyway. So yeah. Oh, and one last thing that I forgot to mention. A lot of Nikon cameras uh, nowadays, well, even like after the D100, added this light switch on top of the um, power switch, which means when you turn on, it doesn't light up, but you can actually switch it or flick it to the side and then it will light up. But the D200 is out of power. So actually, I can actually show it to you. 
here it actually lights up a little bit there the d600 actually lights up a little bit but um with the d100 uh there's no light button on this like or light switch once once you turn the screen on actually the light comes on with the screen and after a while it turns off so yeah but the light is actually not as bright as the more modern or even as bright as the d200's light despite that the light actually works even though if you're in the super low light situations or if you're in like event situations where you just want to use this camera to photograph some of the event things like that the light will actually be bright enough to actually allow you to operate and see your uh, settings from up here so yeah that's it for this part oh and if you're wondering the AF assist lamp actually works if you like to annoy your subjects especially if they're you know alive with eyes then <laughs> you can actually flash them with these uh, assist lamps and it actually will hurt their eyes very badly but it does help you to actually you know focus better in low light if you're into that sort of thing but of course if your subject is let's say miles away from you or like over 100 kilometers away from you because you're on top of a mountain and trying to photograph the actual landscape in the middle of the night then of course the assist lamp will not help you with that but if you're shooting like portrait at low light situations it will help you just be careful it will be very annoying and it could be very blinding to your model so just to keep that in mind and now to the image quality and you might actually think that this camera might not actually deliver a lot of things onto the table but this camera to me has a very nice and classic 60 megapixel CCD sensor inside and that actually means you're actually getting a lot of the very nice old vintage kind of look old vintage CCD digital look as well which to a lot of people can be really nice it just adds some sort of cool yet very nice character to the image and it doesn't look too digital and I just want you to actually pause on that a little bit because it's not too digital well this camera if you remember actually came out way back in 2002 and of course it was just trying to win a lot of photographers from using analog cameras switching to digital cameras and by that a lot of digital cameras had to actually produce a lot of film like images images or just images that really is compelling enough for photographers to switch over from analog to digital because if you actually look at earlier digital cameras especially the compact ones the digital look really atrociously bad and yeah a lot of photographers were using professionally film cameras using for their professional jobs at the time was you know just wasn't convinced with the uh, digital era so with these cameras they also have to produce a lot of like you know not really high contrast images as what you would really see in more modern cameras and you have more of these faded look yet really nice character look to it and it's just something that you don't really get with more modern cameras or even cameras from like 10 12 years ago and it's actually really nice to really just you know operate with this camera use it and just see the different kind of colors this camera actually produces different kind of characteristics or even just shooting in raw and just see what kind of raw images how the different color would react in the lightroom um, profile or just how different color would react in different um, color adjustments so it's just really interesting to see and also really see the rendition of the images from this camera talking about the rendition the rendition is also quite unique from this camera it's not the most natural rendition in the world far from it actually if you really want to push the camera you can really push it really easily and the file will just kind of um, a break very easily without even having to manipulate them but if you do want to manipulate them please just be careful because the file isn't as robust as even let's say from the camera from 10 or 15 years ago so just keep that in mind because during that period of time from 2002 to even 2007 cameras were really evolving really really quickly but from let's say from 2010 to 2015 there wasn't really a lot of innovation being added to cameras you know during that time period kind of well like what you see with computers nowadays so just keep that in mind but when you do get it right the color the characteristics the rendition is just even though it's not perfect but it, there's some sort of character and magical to it and i think that it's still worth to actually explore if you're that kind of photographer who just wants to explore and don't mind you know going down to like six megapixels because let's face it even your photos that you post on instagram or facebook it's under three megapixels so having just six megapixel in here you still have plenty of room to just print a3 or a4 size images quite neatly as well 
and it just really all depends on what you really do. The color tones, the skin tones on this camera especially is actually not bad. I find it actually quite nice. It renders skin tones really differently from how more modern cameras would actually render skin tones, but it's actually still really nice and pleasant in a different way, but still quite nice and pleasant, if that makes sense. You really have to try it yourself. There's this kind of smoothness going on. Of course, that will probably have to do with both the lens and the 60 megapixel sensor itself, that it's actually not always magnifying all the fine details and make things actually more soft. But on top of that, it's also like how the camera were programmed to actually um, render all these colors that is actually quite soft and quite actually pleasant to look at and kind of relaxing at the same time for the eyes to look at. Of course, the dynamic range is not the best in the world, actually far from the best. It actually has quite bad dynamic range, but you can still make it work with this camera. And the fact that it actually has low dynamic range actually gives you the benefit of giving it that film look because the faded part into the shadow is kind of just faded rather than being like black without no information or anything like that. So it's actually really good. And yeah, as I mentioned many times now, it's worth experimenting. So yeah, just, just give it a go. But where you have to be really careful as well is also the Moray and aliasing on this camera. Just like any old camera, especially digital cameras, it's really bad. So just be careful of the Moray and aliasing. But I guess if you're looking to this camera, you're already aware of that or you just don't really care and just care more about the color, in which case just go for it. So yeah, that's it for the image quality. It's very short, shorter, much, much shorter than all the other cameras that I really talk about the image quality, apart from film cameras, of course. But yeah, now to my conclusion. Well, there's not really much to say because for the conclusion part, I would both recommend it and don't recommend it. If you're looking into photography, like really just looking to the 50 euro camera market, I don't recommend this simply because you can do much better with even the D5000, which is also around 50 euros or the D60 or even the Canon 1000D, Canon 1100D, Canon 40D, Canon 30D. In terms of, let's say, delivering photographs outputs, you can actually get more out of those files. And it would actually be a much longer investment in terms of using those cameras for a longer period of time before upgrading than using this camera. But on the other hand, if you do already have this camera and if you just want to learn photography, yes, you can actually learn the basic of exposure triangle, like the aperture, the ISO, and the shutter speed. But, you know, if you want to like, really get the long-term output out of this camera, I think you might be better off with even the D5000 as mentioned earlier or the 1000D, things like that, because those are still roughly in the 50 euros price range of this camera. And yeah, it will just allow you to actually do more professional work with them as well. Not to say that this doesn't deliver great images. It does, but you just have to work a bit harder and just have to learn its limitation a bit more. But if you're one of those people who just like older camera look, as well as just experimenting with different color tones and everything, then this camera is still a nice camera to experiment with because it has really unique CCD sensor look versus CMOS sensor. And having such an old digital look with really unique kind of color rendition really gives you this kind of pleasure of experimenting. So yeah, depending on which priority you have, uh, this might be a camera for you or it might not be a camera for you. And for me, I really love using old cameras because I love using you know, the older technology, the kind of like different controls and also the different look that it gives. But I know that a lot of people looking into old cameras are not always having this priority in mind and they might just want, you know, older sensors, but producing the more modern results, which this camera doesn't really give. Although you can really just tweak, knowing its limitations, of course, really tweak the images to just give you good enough output to maybe do some basic product images or do some basic portraits or even some sort of complicated lighting projects if you're really into that, but you also have to pay more attention into your lighting than the camera itself, of course, because you can't tweak the file on here as much as you can with the more modern cameras or even cameras from 10 or 15 years ago. So yeah, just to keep that in mind. But of course, if you're a collector who likes to collect cameras and just use old cameras as well, this is another camera I would also recommend, especially when everything is just very different from what Nikon usually do and design, even like with this camera, with, you know, the previous film 
cameras, but also the digital cameras that came after that. It's just very different with this camera, and you still can see the mix back between the two worlds, if you know what I mean, and also the value are starting to actually increase, depending on the area where you live, of course, because even though I was lucky enough to get this for 50 euros, a lot of people are starting to sell it for over 100 euros. Of course, eventually, if you do it like from bidding or if you have enough patience, you will still be able to get this for 50 euros, no doubt. So yeah, I would just like to leave it with that. If you need a free photography guidebook, it's absolutely for free on my website. I will not bombard you with any newsletter nonsense. Just click and download. The link is down in the description section below. Whew, I'm really losing my breath. But yeah, otherwise, thank you very much for watching. Stay safe, have fun shooting. Till next time, bye for now. Thank you.